Okay, we're standing here, and this is our sixth week that we've been worshiping in places other than our sanctuary and our home buildings. And we pray that in just a few weeks we'll get to gather back there again face to face. But for now, in these last six weeks, we've been in various places, out in nature, and even around the world. It's also getting close to summer. And how many of us remember spending time at summer camp, um, or even just at a getaway weekend, sitting around a campfire, singing songs, talking about Jesus, um, and praying for each other. And today, as the sun goes down, we come to worship here in this summer campfire. For many of us, it's been more than just a couple of years since we've been sitting there at a campfire. And so you'll have to imagine the breeze, maybe the scent of the pine logs on the fire. Uh, but I invite you, I invite you to be with us in worship at this virtual campfire. Well, here we are, sitting at summer camp. We're at, gathered around a campfire, and the stars are just brilliant. You could see the sun just barely down below the horizon, so there's just that golden glow, but the stars are coming out. Now, the heavens declare the glory of God. Glory to God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Glory to God on high. The earth is God. The earth is God's and everything's in it. Praise, Praise God, God who created, created everything, everything good. good. Well, you may not know this one, but let's just sing along with this one anyway. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord and He gives me a song.
today comes from Genesis uh, chapter 5 and 6. This is the list of the descendants of Adam. When God created humankind, he made them in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them humankind when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be one hundred twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God went in to the daughters of humans, who bore children to them, these were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. <laughs> we don't always love as we should, 
we're not as patient as we should be. We take when we ought to give. Lord, we thank you for the life and forgiveness that we have in you, for the gift of your Son, Jesus, that we might have life, that we might have it abundantly. Oh, Lord, that your Spirit would keep us aware of your constant and abiding love. In this time of quarantine, of distance our, distancing ourselves from each other to assure health, to assure that we do no harm, that in fact that we do good. Keep us ever aware of your presence with us, confident that come what may, you walk with us hand in hand. O oh Lord, for those that are sick, bring a special awareness of your presence and longing to have you near. For those of us who give care, strengthen us in such a long and drawn out time of caregiving. For those who are lonely and depressed in this isolation, the grace of your presence. And for those of us who can comfort and give care, oh Lord, the guidance to know where, when, and with whom we should be. And Lord Jesus, for those who do not yet know your saving grace, we ask a special measure of your presence, that they would know you in a new, personal, and intimate way. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Our New Testament reading for this morning is from Romans, the third chapter, verses 9 to 24. This is the Apostle Paul speaking or writing. So what are we saying? Are we better off? Not at all. We have already stated the charge. Both Jews and Greeks are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no righteous person, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who looks for God. They all turn away. They have become worthless together. There's no one who shows kindness. There's not even one. Their throat is a grave that's been opened. They are deceitful with their tongues, and the poison of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are quick to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and they don't know the way of peace. There's no fear of God in their view of the world. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. In order to shut every mouth and make it so that the whole world has, an, has to answer to God, it follows that no human being will be treated as righteous in his presence by doing what the law says, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. But now, God's righteousness has been revealed apart from the law, which is confirmed by the law and the prophets. God's righteousness comes through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who have faith in him. There's no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory, but all are treated as righteous, freely by his grace because of a ransom that was paid by Christ Jesus. These are the words of God for the people of God. Now, I have to confess I may have gotten the cart before the horse last week. We talked about new birth, born again. We, we did talk about why. Why do we need to be born again? Why do we need rebirth? And why is it needed? And today we have to come back and talk about that in more detail. It's all about our worldview. What is humanity like? Are we at our roots good? And if we are, why is there so much evil in the world? Is it society that corrupts humanity? If we get rid of society, you know, the awful influence of government and politics, then everything would be okay because the inborn goodness of humanity would emerge and we'd go back to the garden, the Garden of Eden. Do you remember 
Crosby, Stills, and Nash sang about that back to Eden, back at Woodstock. They sang, we're stardust, we are golden, we're billion-year-old carbon, and we got to get ourselves back to the garden. Now, that may seem pretty out there, pretty crazy even, but some of what we think and feel, even for those who are lifelong church members, may not be all that far from Woodstock, and we have to get ourselves back to the garden. I hear this idea when I hear words like, I hope I've been good enough for heaven, or I'm as good as the next person. Who are you to tell me I'm not good enough for heaven? You see, we, we live in a world, for the most part, that believes in the essential goodness of humanity, that the remedy for evil in the world is reason and education, and that humanity can control its own destiny. Our culture believes in the inevitability of progress, that evolution, controlled by survival of the fittest, will always lead to ever-increasing perfection, despite all the evidence and experience to the contrary. Let me give you just two examples. I'm going to call this first one the law of mine. Have you ever noticed that you don't have to teach children to be selfish, to put themselves above all others? See, what's the first word that almost every child says? No. What's the second one? Mine. There was an experiment an experiment cut, uh, conducted in the 1950s right here in Oklahoma. It's called the Robbers, Ca Robbers Cave Study because that's where it happened. Twelve-year-old boys were brought to Robbers Cave State Park and they were divided into two groups and neither group knew about the other one. And they were given a week at camp with a whole bunch of tasks that would make them learn to work together, you know, to grow, to grow teamwork, to com grow companionship, to grow a bond. But then after that week, they were told about the other group, and they were brought into contact with that other group for games. You know what happened? competition began immediately. It got pretty intense. They began to tear each other apart. They almost immediately saw each other as enemies. They vandalized each other, stealing supplies from each other, and fights broke out. Later, after they were told that the game ended, the hostility, the enemy war tactics between the two groups continued, and the experimenters had to devise new experiences to reteach the boys to unlearn the violence that came out naturally. It surprised the researchers. It didn't surprise William Golding, who about the same time wrote that novel, Lord of the Flies. You might have seen the movie. It's a story about boys of about the same age as the boys at Robber's Cave, but Golding's story was about the inborn savagery of humanity. And yet, and yet we look at our world around us and we want to explain the goodness of humanity, humanity that deep in our souls we are basically good. And we look at crime and selfishness and greed and outright evil that seems to be everywhere. So how do you suppose we get the idea that humanity is at their core good. Well, I suspect it has a lot to do with the tendency to overestimate our own goodness. I'm good, and most of humanity must be like me, so most of humanity must be good. But the Bible's description of humanity and human nature is vastly different from the favorable pictures that people have drawn ever since the 1700s about the time our country was born. It was then that the overall philosophy was of the goodness of humanity, and because of that goodness, we would be able to govern ourselves. Now hold on to that for a minute. Where are we going with this story? Just, just sit tight. We launched this series of sermons last week about cornerstones of faith, the foundational understandings that guide 
how we live our lives as Christians. And to do that, we're following a series of key sermons from the founder of Methodism, John Wesley. Last week, it was the new birth. If you missed that message, you can find it on YouTube. Today, the title of Wesley's sermon was Original Sin. And we're going to investigate this subject with key points, key questions, in the same way John Wesley did by asking the questions. What's the problem? Wesley was a lot less gentle than that. He said, know your disease. So what's the problem? What's the evidence? And know the cure. So first, the problem. The problem is that people don't do what they know to be good. In the Bible, that's called sin. So I suppose we have to start with the definition. What is sin? Well, basically, breaking the Ten Commandments? Okay, but, but what's that? What are those rules? It really is the breaking of relationship with God. It's the breaking of relationship with each other. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree, what was that? It was a violation of a trust agreement between them and God. It separated them from their life source, the connection between heaven and earth. And actually, you know what that's like. You tell someone you love, someone you trust that you care for, don't touch my stuff. And there may or may not have been a reason, but then they touch your stuff, and you look, if you look honestly inside, the disappointment, even the anger at the transgression is not so much that your stuff was touched as it was that your trust, your relationship was violated. And when that happens, it takes a while to restore the relationship. If it happens often enough or with enough violence, the relationship is irreparably broken. Ashley read for us earlier from the book of Genesis and the passage was really kind of weird and there have been all kinds of struggles about timelines. Adam and Eve living 800 years, really? I mean, or what it means. What are the Nephilim after all? Did this really happen? All we're going to say about that today and get from it today is look how many pages, only a very few, from God's perfect creation to chaos. And in verse 5 of chapter 6, it said, the Lord said, to humani the Lord said that humanity had become thoroughly evil on the earth. But some might say, there's no such thing as Adam and Eve. But if you do, you just miss the point. The Bible's far more interested in affirming the reality of sin, of evil, than where it began. You see, in my Bible, that happened on page 6. And the rest, all the way to page 1511, is about the need for repentance and the promise of God's redemption and the gift of Jesus to make all things new. The fall only took a few short paragraphs, a few short pages, but the effects in God's pursuit to draw us back to himself, that's the whole rest of the Bible. You see, the doctrine, this cornerstone we call original sin, is not a theory of how sin came into the world. Rather, it's the understanding that all of humanity finds itself in a condition or a state of captivity to sin. This overwhelming pull, this tendency to break relationships, that's the problem. Okay? But what's the evidence for that problem? Well, and that's where we turn to Romans chapter 3. In chapters 1 and 2 of Romans, the Apostle Paul laid out the sinfulness of humanity and the fact that everyone in their heart knows there's a Creator. Everyone knows that no one measures up to what they know of God and even what they know from nature. Paul was talking to the Gentiles. 
But here in chapter 3, he turns to the Jewish people, the church people, the people who've been taught scripture all of their lives. And in verses 9 to 12, Paul was quoting from the Old Testament. And the Jewish people reading or listening to that would have known the scriptures he was quoting. And for us, the other listeners, we know deep inside that he speaks to them. He speaks to us about how people really are. Everyone is. All of us are sinful and corrupt. Now, some argue all morality is relevant or relative, but in actual practice, there truly is not huge differences even among cultures, even from person to person. We can talk about that in depth at another time, but for now, just to say that most people have a consistent sense of what is moral. But what about us? What about me? We follow and obey the Ten Commandments. We obey the law. And Paul argues that some view the law as a way to earn credit with God. But Paul says, by the way, <laughs> by the way, he was trained as a lawyer, so he kind of knows the law. Paul says, that's not how law works. Law works only to restrain and inform people to make it really clear about how things are supposed to be, what relationships between people and with God are supposed to be like. Law is not given as a way to earn, to merit relationship. It only exposes the flaws of how relationships are broken. Laws expose sin or wrongdoing. Well, some argue, I'm as good as the next person. My good outweighs the bad. I think God will take me. But here's the thing that Paul lays out. We're actually powerless against it. Sin has a power of its own over us. It's not a matter of degree. You either are or you aren't. You carry the disease and don't realize it. I'm trying. I'll do better next time. We don't have to teach our little ones to try and cover up what they know to be wrong. They just do it without being told or instructed. And I suspect, I suspect that there's really not one person in listening this morning that if we're ruthlessly honest with ourselves, we go against what we know to be right at times. And I can actually hear it now. Oh, you just have an overactive conscience. You need to get over that false sense of guilt. But even that reveals that we have to give reasons why the going against some good or even just not doing some good is actually acceptable. Now, that's not to say that there is a, such a thing as false guilt, but that's another subject for another time. You see, Paul in Romans 7 says, what I suspect every one of us have said to ourselves at one time or another, I don't know what I'm doing because I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the thing that I hate. But if I'm going to do the thing that I don't want to do, I'm agreeing with that law that is, that is right. But now I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it's sin that lives in me. I know that good doesn't live in me. That is in my body. The desire to do good is inside of me, but I can't do it. That's Romans 7, verses 15 to 18. How did this happen? How did humanity get itself into this mess? After all, we believe God created everything good. Well, it's the separation. It's the separation by breaking that relationship from God. Separation from the God who is the source of all life. So what is this thing? You've probably seen those sci-fi, science fiction, alien movies where the monster breaks out from inside the person. In Christian cornerstones, 
for understanding the technical term doctrine. It's what we call original sin. It's not the origin of sin. Original sin is that inborn tendency, that inborn propensity to sin. Original sin is a distinguishing characteristic of Christianity. Other religions hold out that there are some, some people that are righteous. But in Christianity, as it says in Romans 3 verse 10, there are none that are righteous, no, not one. Everyone that denies the presence of original sin in humanity as a fundamental point distinguishes themselves from biblical Christianity. Some may admit to some vices, even some that are inborn. Some might admit that there's as much an inclination to do evil as there is to do good. But that is not biblical Christianity. You see, we have to know the disease to look for, to see the cure. That's the reason for all this social isolation that we're doing now with COVID-19. You see, no one truly knows what this disease is all about to be able to use that knowledge to find the cure. Original sin says you were born with that tendency. You were born with that tendency to sin. Born of God. That was what Jesus taught Nicodemus. That's what we talked about last week. New birth is the cure for this disease called original sin. Unless we understand that disease, the inborn tendency to sin that requires a radical cure, without that understanding, Christianity is just another self-help program. If we believe that humanity is at its core good, then we only have to clean up the outside. The outward religion is all that's required. But if we understand the disease, we understand original sin, the inborn tendency handed down since Adam, the propensity to sin, then we can look for the cure. And here's how Paul said it in Romans chapter 7. He said, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subjected to sin and death? Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. When we understand that, then we truly get it. We understand it, and then God can lead us to the truth that Christ loved me and gave himself for me. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through repentance and humility, God removes the deadly disease of pride, putting ourselves above all others. Through meek and thankful submission to God's will, He heals us of our selfish will. God leads us to understand fully the need for new birth, the new creation that God promised in Romans 3, 22 to 24, it's like this. God's righteousness comes through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who have faith in Him. There's no distinction. All have sinned and for, fall short of God's glory. But all are treated as righteous freely by His grace because of the ransom that was paid by Christ Jesus. If anyone be in Christ, that person is a new creation, born again. Old things are passed away. Everything is new. Everything is done for us. Ours is but to receive. Nothing to brag about, only to be thankful for. So that, that's the problem, original sin. The evidence, <laughs> there's plenty. The cure, it's new birth. Born in sin, but born again with a new spirit, the spirit of God in you. Do you see the need for this new birth? 
Are you born anew? Wonderful if you are. Be thankful. Let that new birth continue to grow in you, to mature fully into the image of Christ in you. Do you see the need for this new birth? To deal with this original sin and you're not yet born anew, then simply acknowledge to God your need for a new heart. Both your inborn nature and your actual responsibility for present wrongdoing, a broken relationship between you and God and you and the people in your life. Acknowledge that to God. Accept what Christ has done for you. It's His righteousness laid on us. A new life can begin. And that new life can keep on growing in you. You can do those things to nurture and grow that new life in you. That's called discipleship. Being an apprentice to Jesus. More on that later. For now, let's pray. Father God, You've given us the words of Scripture all the way from Genesis, all the way through the rest. You've given us an account, an account that explains what happens in each and every one of us, a tendency towards self, a tendency to break relationship with you, to break relationship with the people, even those that we love. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice of your Son that we could be made right with you, that we could receive a new heart with your words written deep inside of us. Father, that each of us would have a new awareness of the depth, the love, that you have provided to be in us, that each of us would be born anew, born again with the life of Jesus, filling us, giving us power, giving us strength, confessing each day where we fall short, that you would be able to take more and more of our heart to be like yours. Teach us, lead us, save us. For it's in the name of our precious Lord Jesus Christ I pray. Amen. Marvelous grace, marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that Exceed our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater
from the riches of His glory through the Spirit. May Christ live in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you have the power to grasp together with all believers how wide and long and tall and deep the love of God is. I pray that you'll know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. And unto Him who's able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine by His power at work within us. Glory to Him in the church and in Jesus Christ for all generations, forever and always. Amen. <laughs>